Hey everybody and welcome to this week's psych social lecture. Um, today we're going to be talking about uh, sensation, perception, and attention. We'll just touch upon touch a little bit upon each of those. I don't think we're going to spend too much time on today's lecture. Um, uh, my name is Chris and uh, I work for Socratic Med. So this is just a quick introduction of what we do. So Socratic Med is a grassroots nonprofit to provide sensible solutions to students with disparate medical school opportunities. So um, I put some of our contact information below. We were just previously working on a 15 week course um, for MCAT prep, and we're now working on our 15 week supplement, which is just gonna supplement the information gaps that were from that last course. So if you're watching these videos and you haven't checked out the original one, please give them a look there on YouTube. You can find them on our website. Um, definitely copy these links. Uh, we have office hours as well. We do personalized office hours with our tutors. Um, you can click that link tree at the bottom. Um, and that will link you to a bunch of these links and a couple of others that'll be pretty useful too if you're interested. And on more of a personal note, my name is Chris. I graduated from Stony Brook University in May of 2019. Um, I, I finished with a pre-med track um, and a BS in Applied Math and Statistics. I took the MCAT in April of 2021 and I scored a 520, which was the 97th percentile. Um, and I got a perfect score on the psych social section. So that's pretty much my specialty. Um, I do psychology, sociology, and also uh, biology. So those would be my areas of specialty if anybody were to come to my office hours. Okay, so the first topic we're gonna talk a little bit about is sensation. Um, obviously everybody's familiar with the five senses that we have. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated, obviously on the MCAT. So we're just gonna go over first the types of sensory receptors that you'll see on the MCAT. Um, so the first class of receptors that I wanna talk about are mechanoreceptors. These detect mechanical disturbances from stimuli. So these are how you, you feel pressure. This is how we feel, um, this is how we hear. This is how we regulate some, some of our GI workings. Um, so a couple of the examples that I used were the auditory hair cells are the mechanoreceptors that help convert vibrations of sound waves into electrical impulses. So again, those hair cells are being physically disturbed by that, uh, by that sound wave and it's creating that electrical impulse. So that's, that's why we would classify an auditory hair cell as a mechanoreceptor. Um, and stretch receptors are those receptors inside the GI tract. They detect distension um, when you know, the stomach or the intestines start to stretch, uh, it's gonna detect that sort of stretch in the membrane and it's gonna reduce appetite. So stretch receptors are pretty versatile and they're pretty common throughout your body. Um, you can't live without them. So same chemoreceptors of the second type, uh, they detect chemical traces in the environment. Um, and the environment could be external or internal. So olfactory receptors, for example, are um, the sort of receptors that you use in your nose and they detect airborne chemicals and they enable your sense of smell. So when you're smelling, really all you're doing is detecting the chemicals in the air. Your uh, olfactory receptors are just picking up traces of chemicals um, and they just try to identify what that smell is. So that would be an example of a chemoreceptor. Um, we also have chemoreceptors inside our blood. So in the carotid and aortic arteries, they help us regulate uh, specific pressures of gases. So we have like pH pressure of CO2 and oxygen levels in the blood. Um, so for example, when your CO2 levels rise, when the pressure of CO2 in your blood rises, uh, chemoreceptors will start to fire and that you know, will induce a bunch of different changes. Um, you'll start hyperventilating, for example, to get rid of the carbon dioxide and bring more oxygen into your body. Um, so those are pretty diverse as well. Uh, we also have nociceptors, which are uh, pain receptors. They respond to pain. Um, so they're the simplest receptors. They usually just fire in response to chemical signals that indicate tissue damage. So it's usually like a, a nerve ending. Um, they can be considered like in their simplest form chemical signals, but they're specif like specialized chemical signals um, that transmit pain to the brain. Um, and you can look over here to the left. Uh, there's a little bit of a diagram and it pretty much shows I guess just all the different receptors integrated actually into the skin. Um, so we have root hair plexus, hair deformation, free nerve endings. Those are the nociceptors for pain. Um, Messner's corpsicle, that's touch. So that's a mechanoreceptor. The corpsicle is another one that identifies vibration. So we have another mechanoreceptor. Um, and you could take a look at all of these on your free time as well if you like to conceptualize things on a diagram. Um, so a few more of the types of receptors, we have thermoreceptors, which fire due to changes in temperature. Um, so peripheral thermoreceptors are categorized three ways. 
Um, peripheral meaning uh, nervous system. We're talking about the nervous system, remember? remember? Um, so they, we have cold sensitive, warm sensitive, and thermal nociceptors. So obviously cold and warm sensitive are going to detect those specific temperatures. And then thermal nociceptors are those that detect pain from uh, temperature. So at a certain point when the temperature gets too hot, the nociceptor, the thermal nociceptor will fire and it'll transmit a heat pain signal to the brain. Um, we also have electromagnetic receptors. Those are stimulated by uh, uh, electromagnetic waves or EM waves. Um, and humans only contain two types of EM receptors, uh, rods and cones, which as you should know from other lectures are located in the retina of the human eye. Um, and I just put a little diagram to the right if you need a little bit of a refresher. Um, those are also known as photoreceptors. The only types of electromagnetic receptors that humans have are photoreceptors and they're just rods and cones. Um, so other animals may use specialized EM receptors for other purposes, um, like using magnetoreceptors to navigate. Um, you can use the Earth's natural magnetic field. I know some birds use that to navigate during migration. Um, bees also have EM receptors for infrared, so they can see on a little bit more on a, a wider spectrum than humans can as well. So different animals have different EM receptors that they use for different reasons. Um, and then really quickly, uh, there are also pheromone receptors. They're not really well studied in humans, so they're not too um, high yield on the MCAT. Um, but it's good to know that they do regulate what they do. They regulate behavior of, um, and they allow for communication between smaller insects like bees and ants. So it's for, um, they'll use them in social settings or in really complex societies that bees, um, like complex insect societies like bees and ants. Um, so they could use pheromones maybe to lead them to a food source, um, for reproduction, so for a number of social functions like that. Okay, so a little bit about sensory encoding. In order to identify and encode relevant information, four properties of the stimulus must be communicated to the central nervous system. Um, so the first uh, property of the stimulus that the central nervous system needs in order to understand and identify what the stimulus is, is the modality. So the modality is also known as the type. Um, so the modality of the stimulus is determined based on which type of receptor is firing. So it could be a thermal receptor, it could be an electromagnetic receptor. Um, so based on just alone, based on which type of receptor is firing, um, that gives the central nervous system some information as to what kind of stimulus we're um, we are approaching. Uh, the location of the stimulus also is communicated by the receptive field of the receptor sending the signal. I don't want to make that sound too complicated. It's basically just the location of, we have a widespread nervous system. So the location of the stimulus is communicated to the central nervous system. Um, the multiple neurons that are in that location will fire in the similar location. And that's going to communicate to the central nervous system where, um, where the actual signal is coming from. Three, the intensity of the stimulus is determined by the frequency of action potentials fired. Um, so the more action potentials fired in a specific amount of time, the more intense the uh, signal is going to be. Um, and I just wanted to mention uh, what range fractionation is. And that is the use of multiple groups of receptors with limited range to detect a wider range overall. So we could talk about cone cells in the eye, in the human eye, for example. We have um, a bunch of different kinds of cone cells in the eye, and each of them can detect a small portion of the spectrum of visible light. So um, if we have longer wavelengths like red colors, there are gonna be a small certain amount of cone cells that'll pick those up. And if you have a shorter wavelength like blue or purple, there are gonna be different cone cells in the eye that will pick those up. So altogether, each group of cone cells allows us to see the entire visible spectrum of light. So that is called range fractionation when we have small groups with limited um, and we combine them for a wider range overall. Um, so four is the duration of the stimulus, and um, that is going to depend, the, I'm sorry, the response to the stimulus is going to depend on the kind of receptor being activated, so the duration of that response. Um, and there are two types, when we're talking about duration, there are two types of receptors. The first one is called a tonic receptor, and that's going to fire continuously as long as the stimulus remains present. Um, so these receptors are subject to adaptation, so adaptation um, this should also be review adaptation is when you are constantly presented with a stimulus, the response to that stimulus is going to decrease, even though the intensity of the stimulus is remaining the same. So it usually happens, for example, when you walk into, say you walk into a bakery and you smell um, really good cookies, it's going to smell really strong 
when you first walk in. But if you stay in that bakery for a couple of minutes and five minutes, you're not really going to smell the cookies anymore. Um, the smell didn't go away, but it's just your interpretation of the smell um, has it's decreased uh, because of that uh, adaptation. Um, and then the other type of receptors that we'd be talking about are phasic receptors, and those fire only when the stimulus begins. Um, so those really usually indicate like a change in stimulus or um, they help like with changes in the environment. Uh, they only fire when the stimulus begins. So they're not subject to adaptation. Those are only the, the tonic receptors. Okay, and then a really quick review of proprioception. Uh, proprioception in broad terms is the sense of awareness of oneself. So it's spatially, um, you know, how you control your limbs, where you can see yourself in space. Um, and it's also referred to as the kinesthetic sense. So proprioceptors help aid spatial awareness. There are any receptors that help aid spatial awareness. Um, they're located in the inner ear. They can help, they can also help aid control of muscles and joints. Um, so those are located in the muscles and joint supporting ligaments. Um, so muscle spindles, for example, will help detect muscle stretch. And we see uh, muscle spindles whenever we study that joint reflex, um, those muscle, the reflex arcs. Um, and we have joint capsule receptors as well, which detect pressure, tension, and movement in your joints. So all of these help us understand how we're using our limbs and understand where our limbs are. Um, so it'll give us information as to how we're standing, um, maybe, you know, different pressure or tension on certain joints, certain parts of our body will give us information. So like, if we look to the right over here, um, this diagram, I liked, I thought it was really cool because it gave you, it give, gives a really good full picture of how proprioception can work in real time. So you have your, um, you have your receptors that are firing, but it's also sort of like a holistic, um, integration of a bunch of different systems all at once, which usually is what any nervous response really is. Um, so in this picture, you can see the brain receives and interprets information from multiple inputs. Um, the vestibular organs in the inner ear uh, send information about rotation, acceleration, and position. So she's going to be using a combination of those two to understand and recognize the actual bodily position that she is in on her hands. Eyes are sending visual information so she can see that she's maybe a foot, a foot and a half off the ground. Um, and the stretch receptors that we were just talking about in her skin, muscles, and joints are sending information about the position of body parts. Um, there's probably going to be a lot more stress on the muscles and joints in her forearms than there are in her calves right now. Um, so if she were not using visual cues to let her know that she were facing the ground right now, those, um, those sort of stretch receptors in her muscles would also be evidence um, to her conscious mind that she is in a different position than standing upright if that makes sense. Okay, perfect time for a review question. So which of the following is not a chemoreceptor? So uh, take a minute, take no more than a minute, think about it, pause the video, because I will uh, reveal the answer and go over it in about five seconds. Okay, which of the following is not a chemoreceptor? Um, so we have A, nociceptor, B, muscle spindle, G, gustatory receptor, or D, olfactory receptor? So the correct answer is B, muscle spindle. Um, and that's just the muscle spindle as we were talking about right over here is part of proprioception. So they help detect muscle stretch. Um, so if they're stretching, they're gonna be mechanoreceptors, remember. Um, nociceptors are our pain receptors. Um, and we did mention, I mentioned before in the video that they can be considered like a simple form of chemoreceptors because what they do is detect chemicals uh, that indicate tissue damage. Um, so nociceptors uh, could be considered chemoreceptors. Gustatory receptors are uh, those that you use when you are tasting. Gustatory receptors are on your tongue. Um, so they also use chemicals. They identify chemicals in your mouth and olfactory receptors identify chemicals that are airborne uh, that make it into your nose. So the only one out of all four of these choices that does not use a chemical um, to create an electrical impulse is a muscle spindle because it's a mechanoreceptor. 